Hello and welcome to Vibrant Lives podcast, a podcast dedicated to your health and well-being. I'm Amanda Hayes, your host, a lawyer who retrained as a nutrition scientist. I'm committed to staying up to date with research in the well-being space and sharing with you credible and reliable content about living a healthy, active and fulfilling life, in other words, a vibrant life. Vibrant Lives podcast is all about nutrition, physical health and mental health. I interview experts in these fields and they explain their area of expertise and provide you with practical knowledge that you can use to improve your own well-being. I also produce my 5-Minute Food Facts series, which are short episodes where I give you the facts about nutrition-related topics, for example, alcohol or coffee, and I publish a monthly newsletter with topical well-being news and reviews of health-related books. Before I introduce today's guest, I'll quickly acknowledge that any information or advice provided in Vibrant Lives podcast is not intended to be used to treat or prevent medical conditions, and it's never, of course, a substitute for advice from your own health professionals. Today, it is my absolute pleasure to be here with Zane Landon. Zane is a mental health and disability advocate, a queer rights activist, entrepreneur, positive change maker, founder and CEO of Positive Vibes magazine. He's also young, in other words, under 30, and he's achieved so much in his life to date. Of note, Zane was selected from hundreds of applicants to attend the first ever Mental Health Youth Action Forum at the White House in Washington, D.C., where he met President Biden and Selena Gomez, just to name a few of the notable encounters. Zane identifies as Hispanic, queer and disabled, and today we discuss identity with a focus on his lived experience. I found this to be a really fascinating discussion, and I hope that, amongst other things, It promotes our understanding of what it means to be part of the queer and the LGBTQIA plus community. Hi, Zane. Welcome to Vibrant Lives podcast. Zane, I'm very excited about our interview today because we'll be discussing some really important issues. And I hope that for our listeners, we're going to expand their understanding of what it means to be part of the LGBTQIA plus community and why it is so vital that we do understand We'll also be discussing your work as a disability advocate, another space I think where expanding our understanding is vital. So Zane, before we dive into your work as a mental health and disability advocate, a queer rights activist and more, I'd like to find out a few things about you and about what you enjoy. So first of all, where did you grow up? I grew up across the country in the United States of America in California. I am currently in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. I just in January, and I work at the National Geographic Society as an internal communication specialist, and I lived in California for 24 years. Nice. It sounds like a, um, a very beautiful part of the world, California. I'd love to visit there one day, a uh, visit again. It's been a long time since I've been there. And do you have a favorite meal? I say I, I love a good Fettuccine Alfredo, especially from like an Yum. olive garden. Do you have a favorite book? Let's see. I feel like it can never go wrong with the first Harry Potter book. Do you know what? I had this funny premonition that you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah. It's just so magical. And that's why even the first yeah. Harry Potter movie is my absolute favorite. Because it's just, it's the introduction. It's it's your first ever glance at what magic is and it's really exciting and very nostalgic because I read watched the movies growing up yeah yeah it it was amazing wasn't it and when you think about how much rejection J.K. Rowling's went through to to get her books published it's incredible isn't it they're so good wow yeah Mm. and are you enjoying listening to anything at the moment it could be music podcast audio book I am currently enjoying listening to, <laughs> I was actually listening today, the um, the Ice Dance from uh, Edward Scissorhands. If you've ever seen that movie, it's where she's dancing in the snow to the sculpture he is creating. 
it's a very song and i think that a lot of those movies have really beautiful music by danny elfman like all all the movies that he has ever done music for like charlotte's web and a lot of other movies have been so Mm. fantastic some real classics i think yeah and uh do you have a favorite holiday destination anywhere in the world (laughs) oh wow um I mean, of course, for nostalgic purposes, I would love to be in California for the holidays, but I really would love to experience Christmas in Germany, Mm. especially how vibrant the lights are and how just peaceful it looks. And my grandma's actually was from Germany and she immigrated when she was, I believe, like when she was 18 or early 20s. So I love to see, you know, a country where my grandma was. from. Yeah, that would be amazing. So, Zane, let's talk about identity and why it matters. I'd like to start by asking you some questions about your identity because it informs a lot of what you do and it will set the scene for our discussion. So you identify as Hispanic, queer and disabled. So when you refer to yourself as Hispanic, tell us what you mean by that. Um, Is that a reference to your family's heritage? Absolutely. And the full scope of my ethnicities are actually German, Chinese, and Mexican. And I identify more as Hispanic mostly because I am majority Hispanic. <laughs> <laughs> my mom was German and Chinese, and my dad was full Mexican. And when I refer to the term Hispanic, I am talking about my, you know, my dad's heritage. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's mostly how I align with all the ethnicities that I have. And is that um, partly because perhaps growing up in the U.S., um, did your father have family around that um, helped you sort of um, embrace that culture? I wouldn't, I mean, what I find really interesting about, of course, different families, different cultures, like mm. every family is going to have a different way in how they celebrate their ethnicity. I feel like my family didn't necessarily completely embrace like Mexican culture, because I don't really know much about it. I don't really know much about the country. Yeah, Um, I don't even know much about Day of the Dead or any, a lot of the customs and practices they have, I didn't really learn about. And they didn't know about it either because they, you know, were from here. And I don't know if their parents taught them. Yeah. But what they did teach me and instill in me is to be proud of your Mexican heritage and that the importance of family is almost always important for every culture, especially for people who are Hispanic, you always hear about Hispanic and you think of, you know, strong family values. And I think that's very true that family, you know, sticks together and also supports one another and holds them accountable. <laughs> All yeah. Those yeah. So that is what they taught me a lot, but I still want to challenge myself and eventually go to Mexico and the places they were from and maybe even learn how to speak the language. Cause that wasn't, I wasn't taught about it. Either. I wasn't taught how to speak Spanish either. Mm-hmm. Neither was my dad or his brothers and sisters. Um, And I think that was a deliberate choice, especially during the time of, I believe, the 60s and 70s. A lot of students who were bilingual just kind of fell behind and were kind of dismissed as um, unintelligent Mm. and fell behind in the school system. There was great um, pressure back in those years, I think, to sort of, in quotes, assimilate. So for someone speaking another language like Spanish, they were sort of almost forced to forget it a little bit and just speak English, which is Mm -hmm. sad, but hopefully uh, things are changing in that regard. And some some people say that there is a privilege in being, uh, like speaking only one language. I don't know. I think that it's both good and bad. I think it, it could be good that I was never regarded as a bilingual student and I wasn't treated differently. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, I also lost a connection I wish I would have had, which would have been this authentic connection to language that I didn't understand from that side. I get the English side, but like, you know, the way the language works different countries is so interesting with how they view the world and how they perceive everything. It's very different from English and and every any other language. And so I would have wanted to explore that more. So it's 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 a good thing and a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when you go to Europe, for example, nearly everyone is bilingual or, or more over there. It's just part of their culture. It's when you come to these countries like 
um, that have been sort of essentially colonized like Australia and the US, um, we tend to stick to the colonizers language. I mean, in Australia, for example, there are more than 250 indigenous languages which are being lost, some of them. It's really sad. There are efforts to conserve them, but they're by and large spoken languages and traditions. So, um, you know, we have to be careful not to lose any more than we've already lost. I actually know someone that she develops robots to teach children or anyone um, Indigenous language that are on the brink of extinction. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting work. Yeah. And moving on, you also describe yourself as disabled. So are you happy to talk to us about what that means and, and why? Yeah, growing up, I mean, I know you asked, I mean, I know you, you, I know you said that I am a mental health and disability advocate. So I'll mention both because, well, they're, they are one, they are the same thing. Sure. And people will split the mental health identity with the disability identity. It's not true. They're, they are the same thing. And, you know, having a mental health condition can be as disabling as any other disability. I don't think we need to look at it as physical versus not physical or anything like that. Cause there are many disabilities that are not apparent mm. and you can't see them like me. I don't have a physical disability. You wouldn't be able to tell I have a disability for one growing up. I definitely experienced, you know, mental health symptoms from a young age, but if it was anger, depression, or anxiety, I mentioned those three things. Cause I really experienced the three of them at different moments. Yeah. I de- and I actually saw a psychologist for a long time when I was um, around middle school to the end of high school. So it was a long time that I was in the mental health care system and it, it really helped. And it gave me a perspective on how to deal with your emotions, mm-hmm. sometimes even taking medication, whatever it is for you to um, live with your, you know, your mental health condition. And then I also struggled a lot in school because I was actually neurodiverse, um, which is a neurodiversity is basically anything that is not neurotypical. Yeah. So people who have like ADHD or OCD or mental health, they would be considered neurodiverse because their brain is just diverse and different, Yeah. <laughs> which is uh, an interesting thing. And I actually discovered I had a disability with neurodiversity when I was in university, which is not really uncommon. There's actually, a, I think, a good chunk of people who don't realize they were neurodiverse till they reach university or even after the fact, mm. get tested after. But I was on a 504 plan growing up in the K through 12 system, which is the system in the United States. Yeah. And a 504 plan, which is what I was on, was like just basically a a plan to support my specific needs with my disability. So I was given like less homework, individual tutoring, and a counselor I got to see because I had a lot of different um, issues with paying attention. I hugely cannot pay attention in school. I had a hard time with homework. And actually, my mom had helped me for a long time until I eventually was able to just learn how to work on it independently and kind of cope with that and create like a timeline and skills for mm. me to actually accomplish that on my own, but it took some time. Mm. So I was like, my parents were very aware and supportive of the journey that I was always on. Um, yeah. So that's how I would describe myself as disabled. I don't even describe as that. I also describe myself as, you know, an advocate um, and not everyone's an advocate. You know, some people, they just exist with their disability and that's yeah. great. That's okay. You know, you don't, you don't need to go into advocacy work. Um, but I do because I just I see the systems of ableism and yeah. people don't know what ableism is. It's the basically discrimination on the on the grounds of disability. Basically the yeah. racism of disability yeah. is the best way to describe it. And I see how the system has been enforced in the healthcare system, in the educational system, and almost every I mean literally every system, but I see it more prevalent in those systems because they impact me more, especially the educational system. And we were saying like educational system has its has a widespread of issues when it comes to inclusive design because a lot of the times that's why neuro no diverse students do fall behind. It's not yeah. necessarily neurodiverse, it's because the educational system is not really coming from a place of inclusive design and how to actually support and help kids learn that come from many different neurodiversities, if that if that if that's how you want to describe it. But that's how I would. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, and we will talk more about that um, later on in the podcast. But I think that there's a lot of examination now of the education system because it is trying to 
force everyone to learn in the same way. And as you say, that just doesn't work for everyone. (laughs) There's so many different diverse ways of learning and neurodiversity and just sitting down in a classroom and listening and regurgitating information, you know, it doesn't work for a lot of people. So the next thing I'd like to unpack, and then we'll tie it all together, is gender identity. And I I do have to apologize if my questions are a bit basic, because I think for many people who are middle-aged or older, which includes many of my listeners, they're confused about it. And confusion and misunderstanding can lead to insensitivity. So I'm hoping that if our conversation today can play a part in alleviating that, then we'll have done something worthwhile. So to try and understand and go to the basics of it, I'd like to ask you, what's the difference between gender identity versus gender characteristics? Mm, And this is coming from someone that I, I'm completely cisgendered. Yeah. So I would say, this, I think that's really difficult. I think I think what people should know first is that there is a difference between gender and sex. Yeah. And that, you know, sex is really what you're born with and mm-hmm. sex is a spectrum. I know people don't see it that way. They'll think that there is male and female, which there is, but there's also a whole, there's a whole section of intersex people yeah. that come a wide range of different sexual identities. Um, and so gender is kind of, Gender is like based in your brain. It's how you express yourself. Yeah. I think gender is really, you know, because gender is in the brain. It's how you feel. Um, and it's really how you identify. And if it aligns with your body or how you how you view yourself, then that's how it is. And then gender characteristics, I do think that would be like how you express yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I don't even think that. To me, it's difficult to see that masculinity, femininity, or even real things, mostly because I don't see how they're real. Because when I look at femininity and masculinity, I think, well, what really are the characteristics of them? Mm -hmm. It's like anyone who is a man can be feminine. Anyone who is a woman can be masculine. And there's many different areas there. So that's what I would say gender characteristics are like. Is that's a way to think about it? I think it's like, um, how you express yourself if it's masculine or feminine. But again, I personally don't think those things exist because you can be anywhere on the spectrum of masculine, feminine. And you know what I mean? It's kind of confusing. Yeah. But- and you can have, well, bits of like in quotes, both. Right. Yeah. Definitely. You know, it's, there's not a definite feminine. Every, I think everybody masculine. has both. Yeah, I do everyone, too. Everyone prescribes if they're masculine or feminine, but even in spirituality, there's the divine feminine, masculine energies. And, they both help each other. They both support each other. Not one's better than the other. One isn't weaker than the other. They both are there to support one another, which is exactly how we should look at the roles of gender and how we should all support one another. Uh, yeah. 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 It is. Um, I think it is confusing for some older people to understand when they've been brought up in quite a rigid system. Anyway, it sounds like it's a gender is uh, more of a fluid concept and it's based I think on how you express yourself and how you feel rather than how you might physically look um so and this can work for sexuality as well because some people think that gender is the only thing that's fluid sexuality is also very fluid mm-hmm. there could be people who you know especially for people who like I identify as bisexual so people who identify as bisexual for, one, for for some, it doesn't matter, but for some, maybe 70% of the time they're attracted to one gender, 30% of the time it's the other. Sometimes it switches, um, and some people don't even care about the gender, and they're really into just the person behind the, the person. gender. Yeah. It, yeah. it is very, um, sexuality can be really fluid as well, and I understand it's easy, not, it's easy to, like, think that identities don't change, but they always do. And even though my, gen, my identity is everlastingly always going to be Hispanic, that will change, because if I actually start learning Spanish the way I view being Hispanic is going to be very different. So your identities do definitely change and there's always fluidity happening. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's necessary because if we never changed, we'd never grow and we'd never learn. So I think we change throughout our whole lives just as part of being on this planet and being human. So I just wanted to ask you too, um, most people have heard of the acronym LGBTQIA+. 
And to actually unpack everything in that acronym and what it means, I think would be a whole episode unto itself. So you've described yourself well just then as bisexual and also as queer. So can you explain to us what queer encompasses? I think queer is basically what more of an inclusive way of saying LGBTQ plus. Yeah. Um, or folks that want to say the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of long and it's kind of nice to say queer instead of having to go into to all the letters. Yeah. But, yeah. And I think it's a good encompassing way because I rather just say queer. And also I like that there's that term, that universal term that I don't have to describe what it is. Yeah. Like if I really don't feel comfortable sharing, like I just say I'm queer. I don't really feel comfortable going into it, but just know I'm on the queer spectrum. I'm not, and I'm yeah. not like straight. I don't have to say that. I can even just say I'm queer. That's how I think the term mm. queer what means now. And I think it's just an all encompassing, inclusive term to describe yourself as not straight or cis. Yeah. And the other thing that's quite nice about that term is it's kind of no one else's business. You know, it's like it's it's nice to identify the fact that you're you're queer, you're part of that well broader group but you don't have to actually pinpoint anything because as you say we it's fluid and we we all change but why do you think then for some people they like to identify themselves as you know somewhere on the spectrum do you think that for people that want to it can help them find a community is there a what are some of the positives of, say, identifying as um, gay or lesbian or transgender, for example? Well, if that is, <clears throat> if those are, if those are their identities and that's how they feel, then I think it is really empowering to identify as that. And I'm not saying that I don't. I'm just saying mm. like I love using the term queer because, like I said, if I don't want to yeah. close what that specific sexuality is, I don't have to, depending on how I feel in the moment. <laughs> But no, I think that those labels and again, those distinctions are really important, which which, which is what makes you know the queer community so vibrant is there's so many different, there's different identities. Um, you know, if it's being if it's being trans or lesbian or gay or bisexual, there's a lot of different identities. And I think that's what's great about the community is like you have all these all these separate parts, but they still come together. But I think also sometimes I will say, sometimes the queer community has to be careful though, because there are a lot of identities like a lot sometimes we're to the point where I think sometimes we're losing that community because we're so spread out right um, because it's so spread out we're like kind of losing people and we're not coming together anymore so they think that I don't know if that is a critique of the amount of identities that are in this space or mostly that they have felt the need to separate themselves in a way from the community because maybe the community isn't as inclusive so there's a lot of different right. There's a lot of different reasons why that might be, um, but we have to do our best to kind of, of course, include and advocate for all of these different groups within the queer space. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just wondering, do you think that, um, you know, we've all heard the ad, sorry, the adage, you cannot be what you cannot see. So as identifying as part of the queer community, do you think that is helping others? If you think back to maybe how you felt as a young person, do you think being open about it is helping others to um, accept themselves and be accepted? I hope so. And mm. it's not even just about me accepting myself, but like, again, telling my story so that if there are listeners who identify in on the queer spectrum or specifically bisexual, that they don't have to feel as alone. I understand yeah. they might feel alone. They might be alone because maybe they there aren't people around them that identify that way. But if you can find someone in your life, even if it's on a podcast and they're talking about their queer experience and they're talking about how the community is vibrant and you can be successful um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with how you identify. I think that is empowering. They may not get it from the people around them, but I think at least hearing it from someone. Yeah. Pretty validating, especially when, I mean, when I was growing up, I didn't even think that, um, I didn't even know bisexuality really existed. <laughs> like I really just knew about, of course, gay and straight I didn't yeah. really know about anything else and there has been um creeps of biphobia that kind of lurk in our culture still even from the queer community that still happens a lot more than I think people think which is more unfortunate that's more hurtful than coming from someone that's not queer because they should know better that's and true. 
they're dividing the community more, which is why I know a lot of queer people who are bisexual that don't associate with the queer community because of these specific reasons. Um, so yeah, I feel like when someone even can describe <laughs> an identity that you didn't even know existed, like if I heard someone talk about bisexuality growing up, I would have been like, that's a thing. Yeah. Oh, now I can actually articulate what I'm experiencing and that it's a real thing. And there are people who actually identify that way. Hopefully the openness about it is helpful for people who, particularly young people who may feel like they don't quite know where they fit in. And if they can see something that they identify with, hopefully it's helpful for them. So I know that we've just sort of unpacked separate aspects of your identity. And that is obviously a pretty simplistic way of looking at a whole person. And to this point, I know that you're passionate about intersectionality. And on a personal note, I understood more about intersectionality when I read one of my favorite books. It was it was brilliant. It's called Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race by Rennie Edo Lodge. And in that book, she shines a spotlight on structural racism. And she also talks about how she was often frustrated um, by feminists who demanded that she sort of leave the race aspect out of discussions about feminism as if she could just discard part of her identity because it didn't fit with other people's agendas. So can you explain to us what intersectionality is? Like, What does it mean? Yeah, and I, I encourage people to, you know, look up different definitions because I think mine might, might be different from someone else's. To me, I think that I'm not going to assume what someone's story is. I'm not going to assume if they're oppressed or not. That's for them to decide. Mm-hmm. So this is what I would say, though. I would say intersectionality is about acknowledging and accepting every identity that you belong to. I mean, again, my intersectionality is being male or um, being queer or being disabled. All of those identities mesh together and they make you and the identities that you encompass create a unique dynamic that no one yeah. else experiences and so just like you said a white woman advocating for feminism has a very different dynamic than a black woman advocating for feminism and intersectionality also means that we embrace those dynamics and we learn about those dynamics to the point where you can't discard bringing up race in the context of feminism because People who women who women of color can't just take that identity away. They can't just remove that identity. Exactly. So it's a very, very insensitive thing to say. And it really speaks to I'm not gonna say the movement. I'm just gonna say to the people in that movement. Again, not all of them, because I don't want to generalize the movement, but and I think that's also why you see like <laughs> I've actually just heard a lot of a lot of um women of color speak about how they don't really align with the feminist movement because it has never really been inclusive to women of color, which Absolutely. is even, don't even I, lend, I align with the queer community either because it's never been inclusive to people of color either. I mean, you can find this tendency um, in every group, but I think some are at least doing a better job of including and some aren't. I feel like as a human population, we have a long way to go <laughs> to, to be inclusive of everyone. But I think things are better now than perhaps they were 50 years ago and hopefully the progress continues um, on that trajectory. So Zane, I'd like to talk a little bit about your advocacy work now. So you're an advocate and speaker for Hispanic, queer and disabled communities. And of note, you're passionate about the promotion of disability inclusion. And you say that um, it's often an afterthought. And I think in the context of employment, we're talking about. So what do you think some of the barriers that employers themselves cite as to employing people with disabilities or neurodiverse people? The, um, I would say the one thing that I have noticed is when you mention someone has a disability, I think employers, and this is generalized, mm-hmm. and I'm speaking to the ones that act this way, not all, every employer, of course. But I think a lot of employers are going to look at someone and go, can you actually perform this job then? Is your disability going to impact the work? We shouldn't even be looking at it that way. We would never look at any other identity that way. I mean, we have, and that's unfortunate. Yeah. If someone does say they're queer, we're going to go, oh, can they not do this job because they're queer? No. Um, and 
if this person with disability does need accommodations, which they might, what's wrong with you providing them? <laughs> uh, and I think a lot of the a lot of things people think about is they think accommodations are too expensive. It's going to take yeah. a lot of money. They're actually not that expensive when you look into them. And it's actually, and here's the thing though, and this is, I guess, a, a business way of looking at it. If, if, if business leaders aren't going to look at this way from a, an inclusive standpoint, wouldn't you want your organization to be as inclusive as possible and to get the best talent for your for the job and if that's a person with disability they're the best talent which means that you should support and accommodate what their needs are especially if it's like actual physical or mental mm. needs for them to accomplish the job for the longest time you heard stories of people with disabilities who would be who wouldn't receive a job or were fired because they needed to work from home and now people are working from home yeah and it's, it's interesting how an equalizer like covid because it did I, I, I mean of course people were impacted by covid differently but it was the one thing that, you know, stretched everyone together. Like we all were experiencing this same like sickness, even though again, very differently. And I think because of that, <laughs> the workforce saw that and saw the gaps in um, what the workforce really had and what it offered a long time ago, not even a long time ago before the pandemic, where where remote work wasn't even really popular. Yeah. And it was it was really interesting to hear about people who are engaging in remote work before the pandemic. But I think that now that remote work is becoming more common, but we're we're still seeing employers somewhat demand people work in person again, um, or if it's hybrid. And I, I like the hybrid model for myself, but there are people with disabilities that they better are going to be better working at home where they have their their accommodations, their equipment, their support than being in the office. And I think employers need to be very aware of that. And I personally think if your job really doesn't, <laughs> if your position doesn't really require you to be in the office, like you can really do your job efficiently at home. I think that you should offer that opportunity for um, people, for employees. And again, this especially really supports people, employees with disabilities. Yeah, I think that has been one of the silver linings of COVID. There probably weren't that many, but that is definitely one of them that working from home is a lot more acceptable and employers have realized that, you know, it can be done. And in some ways it's even more efficient because um, people that had long commutes no longer need to sort of waste their time on a train or a bus. They can actually work. Um, so hopefully that will trickle down and the excuse that you cited that it's too expensive to employ a disabled person will be, less and less of an issue and who wouldn't want to have a more diverse inclusive workforce anyway it's more reflective of the community at large and surely that's good for your business i would agree it is good for your business because again if you're bringing in people with different perspectives they're going to be the ones to challenge things and that could definitely immensely support your company even more so again from a business standpoint if you're not hiring people with disabilities and you're not engaging in the disability community you are losing out on a billion people in this world because 16% of the population has a disability yeah. and that's over, that's over 1 billion people. That's a lot of people. Um, and I think there's a lot more because there are a lot of people that don't even realize they have a disability. Some people may be like, I have diabetes. That's not a disability. It's a, it's a disease. No, it's a disability. <laughs> yeah. there's nothing wrong, nothing's wrong with having a disability um, or pe uh, cancer is a disability. Being neurodiverse is a disability. Like I said, so many people don't even realize they're neurodiverse or have a disability till later. Um, yeah, so that is what I would say. And then I think also another issue is, uh, this is like really horrible bias, but just the assumption that people with disabilities can't work, which is a horrible yeah. assumption. Yeah, it is. And I know people that are like, that, that are very inclusive and um, very understanding of other communities, but have a hard time with the disability community and go, well, I mean, like some of the, like there are people with disabilities that can't work. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess some can't, but they're applying for a job. So I'm sure they can then. Like, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the, <laughs> it's very frustrating thing to hear. Cause it's like, it's imagine saying something like that to someone with regarding any identity. It's like, we would never say anything like that. And it's not for you to assume if they can work or not. If they're coming to you for a job, they believe they they can do it. So I think that you should listen to them and empower them if they're good enough for the job. 
not from their disability, from their qualifications, you know? So so, I think there's so many different things on why employment, unemployment is so high for people with disabilities. But I think it comes down to assumptions and an unwillingness to welcome them in in an organization. Yeah, I think there's a lot of barriers out there in the way of dis- disabled people finding work that is going to, you know, be good for them and and fit them and the way they can then contribute to the well business and community and then you know f- just feel better. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, there's uh we've got a long way to go, I think. But hopefully there are some advocates like you and some here in Australia who are making a difference. Recently, you were one of 30 young people selected to attend the Mental Health Youth Action Forum in Washington, D.C., so congratulations. I believe that you were selected from a a huge pool of applicants, applicants, so that's fantastic. And so why was a forum about mental health um, for youth, why was it necessary? I believe because for the longest time, well, for one, we have not focused on mental health to begin with. I'll just mm. say that. But when we have focused on mental health, we leave out children and young people and young adults, which is really interesting because young adults are really impacted by mental health to the point where is it the, um, I can't remember, but I think it's the second most common death for young people is suicide, which clearly points to a trend here that suicide, suicide, that suicide and mental health are very prominent issues within, you know, communities of youth. Mm. So I think it was incredibly necessary, which is why it was the first ever mental health youth action forum at the White House. I don't believe the White House has ever done a mental health forum all about youth and also like intersectional youth, where what was great about the forum was the 30 of us, we all brought something different to the table. If it was identities or how we viewed the world, there were a couple of people there that were advocates for disability. And I was like, that's so exciting. Cause in a way we're all advocates for disability, but again, we separate, the, <laughs> we separate yeah. them. And there were some of us talking about accessibility and how do you make the space accessible? Cause again, if you're hosting an event and a space isn't acceptable, <laughs> isn't accessible, accessible to me, like, that's unacceptable. And again, you're losing on people. And to me, that's an equity issue. Some people don't see it that way, but if a space isn't accessible, you can't, like there are certain people with disabilities that literally are not going to be able to participate in the event, which means they lost an opportunity, which means the people that are there, they get to move up and people with disabilities don't. Yeah. And and they're not going to, of course, like physically move up the, the people who are attending the event, but it's still an advantage they're getting of the knowledge that they're gaining. So anyways, yeah, the form was incredible. And when I first saw it, I didn't really know what to think. I was like, okay, this sounds interesting, but is it really at the White House? So I looked more into it. It was at the White House. MTV planned it, and then like 14 mental health nonprofits were involved. And I'm talking wow. like Jed Foundation, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, um, Born This Way Foundation. So I was like, okay, stakes are really high because I know that these organizations are involved. I know that this event is really meaningful, and also Active Minds because I will say that I was really involved in Active Minds, and they're a they're a mental health organization that support um, mostly college students with mental health. And that's where I that's where I first learned about the forum. And of course, when they were involved, I, I knew it was a, a great thing that was happening. It was a wonderful opportunity to be in Washington, DC and yeah. to speak at the actual forum, how it worked was um only a couple of us got to speak. I was the speaker, but they chose six. Um and they we were all there on stage though, and we're listening to the conversation. And it was mm-hmm. a conversation with Dr. Murthy, the Surgeon General of the United States, and he has been very vocal about mental health. Um, in his writing and his in his speaking, as well as uh, Dr. Biden was there and she spoke about youth mental health. Um, and then the last person that was there was Selena Gomez, who is basically the keynote, um, yeah. the celebrity keynote. And I'm glad that they chose someone like her because she's incredibly very open about her mental health experiences. Someone with a lived experience involved in a campaign like this, I think is really important and yeah. it was really exciting I could I could tell she was nervous and her mom was there so it was very sweet and I don't even know if she ever thought she would do something like that so it's really cool to see and it's nice to see an influencer just living their life being an advocate for mental health not really getting involved in people's drama <laughs> um, yeah. I just I like that because I see a lot of influencers that don't use their position in the best way and I think yeah. if you're an influencer it would be really 
smart about how you're communicating with your audience. If you're spreading misinformation about mental health, or if you're just jumping on it because it's a trend, I think that it's nice to see people actually engaging in these authentic conversations. And it was such a great thing to see. And I don't know if any like physical change came out from the forum because I don't know. Um, since it ended, we've all been connected. Opportunities have come up from the MTV. Yeah. But like I don't. But I still think that if anyone was tuning into the news and they saw the mental health forum, that's already enough to change someone's mind and really even change a whole family dynamic and then change a community. Like it just, it's like a little effect that happens. And I don't know how often we get to see mental health discussed like that. And a national point of view from the White House was a very incredible mm. thing. To well, it indicates that it's been taken seriously. And I think that's important. So what was the overall aim of the forum? Was it just to promote discussion or was there um, sort of some concrete goals that were trying to be achieved? Definitely the, uh, I think there, there's like two parts to the forum. There was the White House aspect and then there was also like, we were actually working with media partners. So there's two sections. Mm -hmm. On Wednesdays, when we went to the White House, we had the conversation and that was about bringing up ideas, our stories on how government officials, lawmakers, people in your communities can make change with mental health. There was that. So the conversation was that. And then the second part was during the forum, we actually were doing like an online boot camp before the forum and we were split off into groups where we had to suggest ideas on how we can use media to um, positively change mental health. Because the whole point of the forum was how do we use media to impact mental health? And yeah. I was all over that. And I think that's partly why I was chosen was because I am really passionate about that I think that media is the way we change mental health because you gotta, you have to tell these positive stories about mental health for people to, again, see themselves on the screen and empathize with that character. And for people that don't really know much about mental health to go, oh, this is what mental health means. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought they were quote unquote crazy people. No, it's like they're actually just regular people trying to live their life just like you, just to have different challenges that you may yeah. not experience. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then this, so we were split into groups and we had to create different media projects and we pitched it to like Spotify and Pinterest and Zoom cool. and a lot of these, yeah, a lot of these giant media companies. And we, uh, my my group, we actually got to work with like Anchor, which is like a podcast platform, which is really cool. And then like some of the groups are working with Pinterest to develop a campaign. Um, really cool, amazing stuff. And it's nice to see that not only is the government taking this seriously, but media companies who have a lot of influence, especially when it, especially like Pinterest or Spotify or Snapchat, again, because social media is so embedded in our lives at this point, you can avoid it, but it's very difficult to avoid it. And since social media is so embedded in our culture, might as well do something good with it and spread yeah. health awareness from, through it, you know? That sounds really positive because, I mean, media is the way to reach yeah. You know, everyone pretty much these days. And as you sort of alluded to before, sometimes it can be used to spread misinformation, which is unfortunate. So the more credible, positive information that is spread via the media, you know, the better for everyone, I think. And that's one of my goals in, in doing this podcast is to get credible information out into the public domain. Speaking of getting things into the public domain, you have um, a magazine called a digital magazine called Positive Vibes Magazine. It's um, an international di digital magazine and a podcast series. I think the podcast is called The World of Positivists and it's dedicated to sharing inspiring community-based storytelling, evoking transformational positive change. So tell us about Positive Vibes Magazine. When and why did you decide to start that? It started in May of 2020. I was taking a class for university, actually, <laughs> on copy editing. And our final project was we need to create our own publication. And he had specific articles that he asked, will these go in your publication? Are they good enough? And tell me why. And I decided, like, I really wanted to create a platform, a digital magazine on positive mental health. Because, again, I feel like even when we hear stories about mental health, sometimes they're very negative. Mm. Sometimes they're they're very like unempowering. And I think that when it comes to storytelling, I think 70% needs to be positive and 30% needs to be what those struggles and challenges are. Because when people are looking at you in the audience and they're consuming what you're saying, 
how are they going to want to change things if it's just dread? Do you know what yeah. I mean? How are we going to be inspired to really create change? It's not from just how terrible it is or how much challenging it is. It's also, hey, it's challenging, but look what I've done. And if we mitigate these barriers here growing up, I wouldn't have had to experience them. So that's where the inspiration I think comes from. And so I decided to actually pursue it. I was I was actually messaging my friend and I had this idea, like, what if I started it? There's nothing stopping me. I, it's, it's building an online community, right? So that's, and then that's when I started to actually pursue it. And since then I've still done it. We've released over 90 stories and we have plenty of more to release. And the magazine was was at first going to be dedicated to writing different blogs about mental health, about our experiences. But then we had someone reach out, a life coach who actually is very open about grief. And my friend interviewed him and we released it. And that's what changed everything. Excellent. After, yeah. After that is when the trajectory really transformed where people were reaching out and then PR firms are reaching out to feature that for us to feature their clients. And I still get inquiries from PR agencies. Um, not all the time. I used to at a, at one point I was getting a lot, but right now it's a little more relaxed, which is fine because we still have tons of interviews to release, but I just, it's just such a great thing. It was a great thing for me to do. And I say great, like for me personally, because yeah. like, really made me a stronger advocate. And I really think that is why I was chosen for the forum because I had something tangibly that I could speak on about media and mental health. That also personally changed me. Like if I didn't start the magazine, I don't think I'd be personally ready to go to a forum in the White House like that. Cause I, I just learned so much about people being vulnerable and a lot of different topics too. I've interviewed people on sexual assault, on racism, on suicide, on being in a gang, a lot of different things. Like because again, mental health stretches beyond every identity. So every single of these experiences still touches on the theme of mental health. And of course, what's so interesting is the magazine has shifted in so many directions where it was mental health. There was a point where we were featuring a lot of spiritual leaders who like are really um, invested in like alternative medicine and, and um, spirituality. And then even like now I'm, we're featuring more people with actual, like with disabilities, people with physical disabilities, mm -hmm. Um, people who are neurodiverse and I I'm happy to do that because again I've always been passionate about disability and for one it was focused on the mental health aspect but now it's like we're getting people who experience seizures um, and how they've lived with it yeah yeah so it's just it's been a really really exciting journey and I personally have changed so much from every single interview that I do that's so good to hear and I will put a link to that in the show notes um so how do you think storytelling because you love storytelling how can it evoke change? Uh, I think, oh goodness, I think storytelling can evoke change when you just naturally tell these positive stories in a way that feels like kind of natural. Mm. Like there's um, there's a new movie, or I don't know if it's new, but it's called Puss in Boots. <laughs> <laughs> Remember what it's called, but it's the most recent one that came out. I didn't see it, but there actually is a moment where um, he has a panic attack. Uh, because the whole movie, he's like um, really fearful of his life. He's on his last life and he's very uh, afraid of death. And he kind of keeps seeing death, which I think is what the wolf is. Again, this is like me watching a couple of <laughs> analysis videos. I, mean, I haven't seen it yet, but I did watch, you know, the scene where he has a panic attack and it's very sweet how the character reacts to it. It's a dog and he just puts his head on his chest and comforts him. And that's what you do. And I think that's how you can evoke change because now you really understand this is how you react to someone who's having a panic attack. Back to the storytelling aspect, like if there's not someone there in your day-to-day -day life that can support you or ask you how you are, what do you need, maybe reading stories about how other people have dealt with adversity is a way that, you know, it can open your eyes up to things you can do to, you know, maybe help yourself or um, feel like you're not the only one going through a certain situation. You know, it really reminds me of like when, <laughs> one of my favorite books and movies is Matilda. Oh, I and love it. <laughs> there's, there's a reason why she always resonated with the characters in her books so much because she didn't have that love in her personal life. Um, yeah, and I agree. And also now that there's social media, of course, be careful with who you reach out to. But if there's someone that truly inspires you, reach out to them mm -hmm. and just say like, you know, I love what you had to say. I'm currently struggling with this and maybe you can have a conversation that way. But of course, be careful. 
So yeah. you don't want to reach out to anyone, <laughs> but you know, but there are still people out there that will support you. And of course there's so many mental health organizations or whatever you're experiencing that reach out to someone there. Of course, you know, they're probably trustworthy because they work for a company. Um, of course, but of course do your research. Yeah. And if, if they don't, if they don't um, know how to support you, they can point you to, in the direction of someone else. Like for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, I'm actually on their next gen, which, which is their youth advisory group. They actually have free support groups for LGBTQ and a lot of different groups. So it's like, I think also people forget that they think that I don't have the income to afford mental health care. But while that might be true, unfortunately, there actually are still organizations willing to provide free resources for you. You just kind of have to look for them. Yeah. Um, and the fact they need to be communicated better, of course, too. <laughs> well, maybe that's where people who have attended the Youth Forum on Mental Health, you know, can help put the word out there that there are these organizations. In any case, Zane, I think it's time for us to wrap up. Thank you so much. Um, you've shared so much with us and it's just been a real joy to talk to you. And I just wanted to close with a couple of questions. What are some of the most important life lessons that you've learned? <laughs> well, for one, I do want to say, well, um, thank you so much for, you know, having me on. I, I appreciate you interviewing me and creating the space. Uh, it's been really a great time being able to share my story. So thank you for that. I will say that, yeah, what's on, I feel like I get this question a lot and it's always different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm envisioning right now is what my mom always said, which was, doesn't matter what you believe in, doesn't matter who you are, as long as you do the right thing or you try to do the right thing, you'll be okay. That's it. I think yeah. that's an important lesson because it's like whatever religion you believe or whatever circumstances you're in, try your best to be a good person. I say try your best because it's hard. Yeah, it is hard. <laughs> I understand, especially if you're in a place where people are not treating you that way. And you're thinking, why do I need to treat people with respect? I don't get it. And I understand. I do. but. I think that, again, I think doing the right thing is and being a good person is it will come, though, because there are times where I felt that way in different spaces. And but when I when I'm considerate of others or I try to be kind, there are people that do that do see me and they do appreciate that. And so I would continue being a kind person. And even if you don't think that you're impacting someone, you are a lot of people, I think just think what's, what's sad is we have a hard time complimenting people. Yeah. Like, let's say you impacted someone. Do you really tell them? Maybe you do, but like some people have a hard time going to someone like, I really appreciate your kindness, but just at the end of the day, every person I think brings value. Um, and I think that you really should acknowledge yours because, and celebrate it. But again, it may not feel like you have, you're not, it may feel like you aren't valued by anyone. Cause I understand what that feels like. Um, especially like, I'm not saying people didn't value me as I didn't know. I just you didn't, didn't see it. feel it yourself. Even. Yeah. And accept, I didn't accept the love, you know? Yeah. So that's why I would say is, you know, know that your value is worth it. And someone is impacted by that value. And Zane, if you could recommend two things that people could do to improve their well being, what would they be? Any two things? For one, I would say, write down what your needs are. Act, like I would, I think people maybe somewhat know, understand what their needs are, but like actually write it down. Say, I need this. I need to spend more time doing this. I need to actually go out for a walk, whatever it is. Again, once you write it down, you're kind of setting the intention. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean you're completely going to do it, but it, it holds you kind of a little more. And I think the sec second thing you can do is, so first, you know, identify what needs you actually want. And the second thing is developing boundaries, I think is really important. I think that's becoming more popular. Like I'm, I'm happy that more people are talking about this. Cause I think that for the longest time people would work past five and work till nine o'clock or they would spend their energy 80 hours a week working on this when it's like, no, I'm going to communicate that I'm setting boundaries. I can't work on this. I'm going to say no. And you shouldn't be offended by that. Cause I think a lot of times the reason why people don't say no is they're worried they're going to upset someone. Yeah. Like if you upset someone to me, Especially if it's something that you like were asked to do, like, no, even something like you volunteered, like, I feel like, <clears throat> or even if it's something asked of you, no, I take that back. It's like anything. It's like, if you really don't have the bandwidth, I would say, I really can't work on this right now. Or if I work on this, I need to sacrifice this other project. Yeah. 
I think being really open about that and setting those boundaries is going to help your well-being. And it's a hard thing. Setting boundaries is not easy, especially, again, you don't know how people are going to react. Yeah, you're quite right. But I guess if you communicate it in a clear and thoughtful way, then, you know, what more can you do? Zane, if people want to look at what you're doing and follow you, what's the best place for them to do that? Well, you can definitely check out the magazine. I know the link's going to be in the episode. <laughs> and so you can check the link there. The social medias are on there. Mm-hmm. It's Excellent. the magazine. And then you can just find me, just type in my name. Uh, I try to make me, I try to make myself as accessible as possible. So I'm usually active on Instagram and LinkedIn and just my name and you'll find me and you can chat about anything you want with me. If it's careers, communication, boundaries, or mental health, I'm willing to chat. Great. Oh, thank you so much. And I'll put links to all of that in the show notes. And so Zane, thank you again for coming on Vibrant Lives podcast. It's been such a joy to chat to you. I feel like we could talk for hours, but obviously we have to set some boundaries here. (laughs) Well, I hope you enjoyed my wide ranging conversation with Zane Landon. If you did, please share the podcast and tell your friends about it because word of mouth is still one of the best ways for people to find out about Vibrant Lives podcast. And if you're feeling extra enthusiastic, please take a minute to leave a rating on Apple Podcasts as that helps people find my podcast and I'm always so grateful for that. You can follow me on Instagram at vibrant underscore lives underscore podcast and on Facebook at Vibrant Lives Podcast. On my website at vibrantlivespodcast.com, you'll find a library of all my previous podcast episodes and reviews of books about health and well-being that I recommend And you can subscribe to my usually monthly newsletter where I keep you up to date with health and well-being news and I promise that it's not spammy. Please DM me or send me an email via the contacts page on my website and let me know what you'd like to hear more of or if there's someone you would like me to interview and I can try and do that for you. I always do love to hear from you, my listeners. So thank you so much. Eat well, move well, think well, live vibrantly.